Uh, now I would like to introduce John Stewart, who is going to, I think, take this up another level or two. <laughs> okay, um, so um, I've been working for the past 10 years or so on um, Tui Tui Matangi and later on uh, Motu Ora. Um, you'll no doubt be aware of Tui Tui Matangi's history. I'm sure most of you have been there and seen it. Um, and almost everybody there except me thinks Tui Tui Matangi is an important island for land birds, um, but I think it's an important island for seabirds. Um, and um, I'll tell, tell you a little bit more about the seabirds on Turi and Motuora as we go along. Here are some of the species um, I'll be talking about. Burrow nesting seabirds and also surface nesters. Um, top left is actually a pycrofts. And I think you'll know the other ones. Diving petrel, grey-faced and penguin. Um, and also, of course, we've got um, the surface nesters. Um, on both islands. Uh, terns and gulls, um, terns and red-billed gulls mostly on, on Terry. So um, I know that some of you are, are also involved in restoration projects um, so I just wanted to cover a little bit about restoration uh, about what we have been doing and um, some of it might be relevant to what you might want to do as well. Uh, if you're thinking about restoring seabirds to your site, and uh, if you're, I think you should be thinking about it, um, here are some of the things you want to consider. Um, what was there in the past? That's going to give you a good clue as to what you can get back onto your site. Um, can you provide good conditions um, for nesting? How are you going to choose which species to target? And that's an interesting one because our knowledge and understanding um, of what can be done has changed over the years. Um, and I can look back at restoration plans for Motuora and Turi uh, from over 10 years ago. Uh, and the current thinking about what we can do has changed quite dramatically over, the, over that time as knowledge of the seabirds has improved. Um, and so um, if you haven't already got um, expertise among your group, um, get some outside expertise to help you decide uh, what you can do at your site and make yourself a restoration plan. Next step, of course, is to get the permissions and funding, um, recruit and train your team, and then you're going to manage and monitor for years to come, years and years and years. Seabirds take a long time to, to get around to it, although sometimes you get remarkably good results quickly, but really these are all long-term projects. Uh, there are three ways you can go about it. Perhaps there may be more than three, but these are the three that I'm familiar with. Um, you can simply manage your site and wait and see what happens. And that's good if you've got small remnant populations or relic populations just hanging on, waiting for you to get rid of the pests. Um, or if there are um, mobile birds like grey-faced petrels, penguins, gulls and terns that might turn up or be in the area anyway and are just very happy to have a new um, protected site at which they can nest. You can also use sound attraction, nest boxes and decoys. Uh, or you can translocate chicks. The sit back and wait technique is one that's likely to work for uh, birds like penguin. Uh, we have um, had penguins breeding on, on Terry and Motuora for many years. Um, I will say that putting out nest boxes is an amazingly successful venture for these birds. Um, three years ago we put out about 20 boxes on Motuora. They weren't dug in properly but we dug them in properly the next season. Uh, now half of those boxes are occupied by penguins uh, and one consistently by a pair of um, brown kiwi. <laughs> uh, we've just put out 20 boxes on Tiri, uh, 29 boxes on Tiri. Um, they haven't been dug in yet. We've got a, we've got a no dig rule at the moment on the islands. Um, and unfortunately, none of those boxes have been occupied as yet. But there are lots of breeding um, shearwaters. And there are some very old boxes from 20, 30 years ago that are falling apart um, that Spencer has, has found um, still actively used by penguins. Um, these boxes are so old, they can look up and see the stars through the roof. <laughs> Acoustic attraction. You've seen some of this before, so I won't spend too much time on it. 
Um, this is a system I've got in on Tiri to try to attract uh, Cook's petrels. Um, all those hundreds of thousands of Cook's petrels, of which many thousands fly over the, the top of Auckland every night and out to the west coast to feed, and they call as they fly over Tiri, um, and they, I'm sure they hear the, the wonderful calls that I'm broadcasting to them, and in my third year, not a single one of them has bothered to come down. And, and so um, it's not just a matter of, of do it and it happens. Um, you've, got, you've got to be patient. Um, we've got to think about what's happening on, with these Cook's petals and why it hasn't been successful yet. Should I carry on for another five years and wait and see? Should I try something different? Don't know yet. Um, that's the actual site where the speakers are. Um, and you saw some photographs earlier um, from sites that are um, occupied by burrow nesting seabirds. And this is the nearest place we could find on Terry that looked like uh, where Cook's petals might, might breed. So pick your site carefully. Uh, this is from Motora. Um, top left is our preparation for gannets. Um, that very happy looking set of gannets are actually all plastic. Um, but on the bottom right, you'll see that they're, I hope you'll see that they're a bit more lively looking. Um, so that project uh, got off to a bang. Um, as soon as we turned the speakers on and stood back, uh, we had gannets landing on the site. Um, they bred the next year, and breeding numbers built up over the next four or five years until we had about 30 birds attending and 12 to 15 chicks being produced each year. Um, but in the year of the peak, when we had, I think we had 11 chicks, um, I came back one day to find 11 very large dead chicks. Every one of them died. Um, the next year we had only four pairs. The year, before, the year after that we have two pairs, and this year we have two pairs. Um, so it's not straightforward. I'm, I actually was, um, I'll, I'll, I'll refuse to take responsibility for this idea. Um, I never really thought it was a wonderful idea to try to attract gannets to Motoora, um, but it did seem to be working quite well, but now it's, t it's taken a turn for the worse, and we're not really sure whether... Um, I mean, gannets obviously prefer to be in big colonies altogether. Um, how happy are they to be just somewhere where there's 10, 15, 20 birds? Um, it seemed to be going well, but now it's not looking so good. Translocation, um, this is a, these are photographs of Pycroft's petrels, uh, which were moved from Fakao Red Mercury uh, to Motoora over a three year period. Um, that's the site on Motoora. We have 101 artificial burrows dug into the soil. Uh, the chicks are brought in, popped in a burrow. They're fed for two to three, two to four weeks until they fledge. They go to sea and you don't see them for two and a half years. Um, some comparisons between the ways of doing it. Um, attraction, obviously the target species have to be already in the vicinity, um, otherwise they're not going to hear your loudspeakers or see your decoy, so that isn't going to work. So you need to have them um, nearby in the first place. It's a lot less expensive than translocations, and it works for both surface and burrow nesting species. So I don't know if there's been much work apart from gannets, but you can obviously do it with terns and gulls, uh, pull them into new sites or uh, restored sites. Translocation, you can deal with a target species that's further away from your site. Uh, it tends to be a lot more expensive, especially if helicopters are involved. Uh, and it's only for burrow nesting species. You can't really move surface nesting species uh, by translocation. Uh, I'm going to talk now a little bit about some individual species uh, that are uh, present on either of the islands. Um, diving petals is an interesting one for us. Um, a survey on Wooded Island carried out by Graham Taylor, Alan Tennyson and Tim, I think, was on that survey. Um, he's not nodding his head to say yes, but the paperwork says he was. Um, there's a small islet off the north of Tirri um, called Wooded Island. Um, and Graham and his team thought there might be 4,800 pairs of diving petrels on that little islet. And, and they, they document in the paper, they said between 1,000 between and 10,000 pairs, um, which actually made them the most common bird on Teri Teri Matangi, which I keep telling my 
uh, woodland bird loving friends and colleagues to their great annoyance. They think that bellbirds and whiteheads are the commonest birds on Terry. Uh, in recent years, the population on Terry Terry Matangi itself appears to be expanding pretty rapidly. Um, I actually remember seeing a talk by Chris some years ago. He showed a map where he had walked right around the circumference of Terry and there were dots for diving petals right around the full circumference. Um, but I think his, some of his dots probably just meant one or two birds. Um, now the dots would be dozens of birds, uh, and in some cases maybe a hundred or more. Um, and they're turning up all around the island in good numbers. Um, so that population seems to be expanding. Um, we have some nest boxes uh, on the island for them, so that's convenient for getting hold of the birds, for tracking their annual productivity, uh, breeding success and the survival of adults. Uh, and it's also convenient for tracking studies. Um, you've seen that map earlier today, so I won't dwell on it. Um, just to say that our birds are doing round trips of about 80 kilometers. Um, and a little bit on their weights. Um, I've now handled uh, well over a thousand diving petrels on Tiri, and I've weighed most of them. Um, a typical bird might arrive in full of food weighing about 160 grams and depart weighing about 130. So they've got a payload of about 25% of their body weight. And that can be used either to keep them going while they incubate or to pass on to the chicks when they're feeding chicks. The um, success rates of the diving petals on Terry, and this is one, one reason why, the pop, why it's expanding probably, is it's, it's very high. Um, uh, most of the eggs laid hatch, nearly all the eggs laid hatch, and I haven't yet found a hatched chick that didn't fledge. Uh, so they've been pretty success very, very successful over the past few years at that level. We get one or two dead birds on the surface. We have a, a resident moorport that likes nothing better than to have a snack on a diving petrel. Pycross petrels, uh, this is Motoora now. Um, 262 chicks transferred over three years. Um, the first return was recorded, a 2013 bird turned up on, in December 2015. By the end of the last season, we had recorded 43 individuals, including, uh, actually, at this meeting last year, I was chatting to Graham about it and saying, there's no chance of getting uh, any unbanded birds because we're too far from Red Mercury. Uh, well, no sooner had I disappeared from the meeting than two of them turned up. Uh, so they, they probably followed in some of our birds um, follow them in at sea rather than just turning up randomly um, at Motoora, we think. The return rates have been pretty, really very good, actually. 2013 cohort, we've now had 30% of those birds back. Um, the expectation, the hope, was it would be at least 20%. Um, we have 13% of the 2014 cohort and 7 of the, two, of the last cohort. Um, but we haven't been going long enough um, to pick up those numbers, so hopefully the 2014-2015 ones will also creep up towards the 30%. Uh, that's 207311, the first bird back, um, just before midnight on the 20th of December 2015. Uh, that's my hand. Uh, it was shaking with joy. Uh, it's, a, it's a long and huge effort, and you have to wait two and a half years to have any hint at all that something was going to happen. Um, and we had thought that they might return, breeding birds will return much earlier than December, but non-breeders come back later, as we now know. But then I was beginning to worry it was never going to happen. Uh, breeding, 16-17 um, season was our first chick, uh, which sadly died just before fledging after a big flooding event. Uh, next year we had three chicks, they all fledged, and last season we had five chicks and they all fledged, though one of them was found predated on the surface later. Um, and just chatting to Helen Gummer recently, she thinks that um, we have every possibility of being the highest success rate for a gadfly petrol translocation um, if, the, if it keeps on going the way it's going. Uh, just a little bit of, of um, information now about surface um, surface breeding birds and what we've been doing there. Uh, Mike Dye's in the audience here. He's been doing this work on Turi Turi Matangi. Six years of surveying of uh, pairs of red-billed gulls on the island. 
Uh, you can see it's quite variable. Three years there at about 100 pairs, and three years up around 300 pairs. Uh, if it stuck around the 300 pairs, we could claim 1% of the population would be internationally important, but it doesn't stick that high, unfortunately. But you can see how, how dramatically it, it varies uh, and the value of doing annual surveys. Uh, one thing we'd like to do is extend this to look at productivity, not just the number of breeding pairs, but how many chicks they raise each year. Uh, a level of difficulty more than what we do at the moment. White-fronted terns is a different story. They're so fickle. Um, almost every year we would have maybe 150, 200 uh, white-fronted terns visit Terry at the beginning of the breeding season, but they don't always stay. In fact, four years out of six, there essentially has been no breeding on the island. And two years, one year we had 120 pairs, 110 pairs, and in 2017 we had about 60 pairs. Um, so the terns are fickle. Um, they move around a lot, they don't always breed on Turi. Um, and although we can make a contribution to the monitoring, obviously you've got, to, you've got to go wider to see what's happening with the turns. Almost finished. Greyface petrels. Um, recently I was given um, a set of huge manila folders. Uh, the paperwork inside wasn't even A4, it was pre that. It was um, old letter or something like that, huge, huge long pages um, from uh, banding greyface petals on Motoora from 1958. So I'll be out there hoping one of them's still alive <laughs> and break a world record. Uh, and it's actually not impossible that one of those birds would still be alive. But I've got a whole series of records. This was Simon Chamberlain who was living on, on Motoora at the time. I'm not sure what age he'd have been then, maybe a uh, late teenager or something. Um, but he, he banded hundreds every year from 58 through to about 62 or so. So I've got all those records recently handed to me. Um, there have been intermittent resurveys of Greyface Petals and Motoora in the 70s and early 2000s, and I'm about to kick that off again. Um, so um, very interesting the way Greyface Petals move around and, and are on many, many sites around the Gulf. Uh, on Turi, um, there are, I've got banding and survey records from 1975 to the 1990s, and I've recently restarted the work there. So there's a lot more work ahead on these two islands, uh, and I would just like to encourage those of you who are not quite as far down the track as they are on Turi and Motoora to work hard, get there, and keep on going. There's many years of work. Uh, and. It's really, really enjoyable. Thank you very much.